Welcome to Prodi Seminar's exclusive course, Acupuncture in Pregnancy and Childbirth, presented by Deborah Betts. So, let's move, move on to nausea. As most of you um, will realise, we really, when nausea in early pregnancy, um, you're talking about a range of symptoms. So for some women, this really is all day nausea. For some people, it's just vomiting in the mornings. For some people, um, this is something that's quite um, bearable. For others, it's sort of a sign that they would actually, by the time they get to see you, they sort of secretly think if they had a miscarriage, it wouldn't really be too much of a problem because it's just so awful. So it really, I think, is important to check out with women about what they're feeling when they arrive for treatment. Um, usually the sort of person who, uh, the advice given to people um, is, those aren't, if that works, they're not coming to see you. So if they can have a cup of tea in the morning and a few crackers and then get out of bed and feel all right or vomit once and then have breakfast and then feel all right, they usually don't seek treatment, but you may see some of those people. The people who are usually turning up have um, quite severe morning sickness or they're verging on not wanting to go in for rehydration or they've passed the magical 12, 14, 16 weeks and now they're terrified it's going to go on for the whole entire pregnancy. So just bear in mind that when you're taking the history, it's not really about how much the women are vomiting. Some women are quite happy to vomit once a day. It's not really a big problem in their life. They just have breakfast and then they vomit and then they have breakfast and then they carry on. Um, sometimes it can be nausea that's absolutely devastating that goes on and on and on. So um, I had a personal issue here because I suffered from it particularly in my first pregnancy um, and I would say it wasn't that any one day was particularly horrific, it was that it went on day after day after day and to be told, well look don't worry this is normal, this is going to go away in three months time is just devastating. So I try to get if the partners are around or if you can talk to the partners about most of us have had alcohol poisoning or a bit of food poisoning at some time in your life and you feel really unwell and unwell and then you vomit and you start to feel better. You're stuck in that feeling unwell and unwell and there is no feeling better for, for weeks. So it's not that every um, day might be horrifically bad, it's that you, that you know that you've got to turn around and go through it again the next day and the next and the next. And that can be really tiring and get people down. And also the lack of support around so that because it's seen as such a common disorder of pregnancy um, a lot of women are working for women who have had nausea in pregnancy and they sort of say things like oh well I had it but I just had my ginger tea in the morning and I was fine or uh, you know the mother-in-law who's saying well actually yes I had nausea but I cooked for my I cooked a meal for my husband every night you know so you get these very unhelpful comments because it's assumed that whatever they had is what this woman has um, and women tend to think they're being really pathetic or what's wrong with them or they're not trying hard enough and you get women telling each other some sort of quite awful advice or getting advice from other people and it's like oh well whenever I felt a bit down I just went out for a good run you know it was sort of <laughs> for some people you know it's like if they've been on bed for three days and dragging themselves around it's really not helpful to hear, hear how some, a cup of ginger tea fixed get somebody else or you know if they got a bit of exercise they'd feel better so that's something that I think we can provide in our clinics is a more realistic that this is a real condition um, that they are suffering from something and that we can be there to support and help them so the real serious bit of nausea and again variations of rates uh, 3 to 20 percent which is a huge range and um, these are people who are vomiting so much they need rehydration now sometimes you'll be in centres where they will rehydrate them at a local medical centre or a GP sometimes they have to go into hospital for admittance but as I said before sometimes if women's electrolytes are so out of balance rehydration can be really effective the problem with rehydration is that while it makes a woman feel better temporary it's usually not a permanent uh, fix. So the idea of using the acupuncture once they've had the rehydration treatment is to keep them well. Sometimes you'll see people and they might have been rehydrated three or four times 
already or they were rehydrated several times in their previous pregnancies. So you can work with that if women do need rehydration. Um, and watching out for signs of dehydration. Like I said before, you've got the dry lips, you've got the dry skin, but especially the urination. Because you get to a certain point where I feel the body just can't respond back. So one of the ways is to ensure that after, so I'm not saying don't treat these women, but follow them up and treat the, check that your treatment has meant they have started to drink and eat again. Because otherwise um, you're possibly just prolonging their um, dehydration. So what actually causes no, and there's no clear cut causes around these different theories. Obviously hormones have, hormonal levels have something to do with it. Whether that's the actual hormonal levels produced by your body to support the pregnancy, or whether it's your brain stem's response to those hormonal levels is a sort of a question. So for some people, um, you may not have so much that you have so many more hormones on board, it may be that you're more sensitive to the hormones that you have, that you're producing, that's producing the nausea and the vomiting. Um, obviously fatigue and stress will make it worse. Whether or not it causes it, I'm very doubtful, but certainly if people are tired and stressed, it will make any slight nausea they had much more severe. And emotional factors. So I just want to mention this briefly because when I, again, it comes back to us supporting women, um, when they're coming to us in, in our clinic. When I was training, when we worked on the wards for the, um, you know, in the antenatal wards where they had these, the women who were being rehydrated, we were sort of told unofficially that you don't give them too much attention because, you know, that, that's what they're wanting. They're seeking attention. So, have we moved on much? So this is from the past. She may be tempted to continue vomiting in order to obtain the commiseration of her fellow patients. The idea of vomiting should be banished from her mind and the best way to do that is to remove the vomit bowl. So this was from a midwifery text in 1964. So you would hope that that was terribly outdated advice. But this is what we have in the 1996 textbook, which is supposedly the best-selling textbook for pregnant women, the what to expect when you're expecting. So in there it says, emotionally those pregnant for the first time are more likely to be subject to the kind of anxieties that can turn a stomach. So that's making it her problem really, she's anxious. Whereas women in subsequent pregnancies may be distracted by the demands of caring for other children. So I do not think that that is very helpful to have as advice in a top selling textbook. It sort of just confounds this whole idea that women need to pull up their socks, get on with it, get out there, get a bit distracted and they'll feel a lot better. And from my experience and the people that I know and I treat, I doubt this, this is not the situation to me. It's that these women are suffering, you know, the nausea and their bodies do need to be strengthened but it's not all, you know, emotional. And I also would like to say, I'd like to challenge any specialist or um, perhaps the person who wrote that sentence, or that paragraph, that if they had food poisoning for two weeks, if they would actually feel very happy with life and they were told it was going to last for another three months. I mean, it can be a self-perpetuating cycle to have this going on all the time. So I do think it's very important to ask women how they're feeling and let them talk about possibly how... Um, devastated they are, they're feeling this unwell. So you see people, I know for those, we're off, probably all doing fertility, you see people with much long for, uh, you know, pregnancies. I've seen people with a whole wide range of pregnancies and I haven't seen a pattern where people who don't want their pregnancies have much more nausea than people who do want their pregnancies. Um, I think that for whatever reasons lie behind it, um, we can be helpful, but it's not always easy to predict who will actually suffer the most intense nausea. And you may have had this in your practice. I've certainly had people that I've been treating for chronic fatigue or some sort of condition where they're quite deplete, quite spleen and stomach deplete, um, and you, they come in and they're pregnant, and you sort of think, oh, <laughs> this is going to be, you know, this is going to be such a lot of hard work for them, and they're fine. They sail through it. Have you, you've come across this in? Your practice, it's like, don't always find it easy to predict who might um, suffer more intense nausea than other people. So there's, I think there's a lot of factors involved in that. Some people even say 80%. You know, if you go on this, that, that, that came from um, midwifery text saying 50%, I think. So it depends on what level you're talking at. 
Certainly, I think it's well underreported because women often feel not exactly, they feel like they're not coping very well. If, the, if they have if they have nausea, and so therefore they um, and they often are told by well-meaning people that there's nothing they can do about it. So in terms of I think it's an underreported thing, and I think it's something we should promote ourselves as being able to do. And I know some acupuncturists are a bit wary about treating it because possibly you're going to get miscarriage rates, etc. Um, but these women um, are really in need of some help, and it's, they're really grateful for the effects that they they find with the acupuncture. So let's just have a look at some of the statistics about using it. So this is, this is a study that was done that was actually published in two journals because she did two separate parts to the study. She did one on how effective acupuncture was and one on how safe acupuncture was. So this is an Australian researcher. She did a randomised controlled trial with 593 women, so a very good size. She wanted to look at traditional acupuncture, so that was a, a traditional diagnosis, versus pericardium 6 only, versus sham, versus no acupuncture. So the woman in the, acup in the acupuncture groups got two 20-minute treatments in the first week and treatment once a week. They had the same out acupuncturist. They looked at nausea, dry reaching, vomiting, and this is the really interesting part that we need to be putting into much more of our research. They looked at health status. So the woman filled out a form, it's, a, it's a, um, a standard research form, that looked at things like vitality, social function, physical function, mental health, emotional health. So what happened was the traditional acupuncture group had less nausea and less dry reaching from the second week. Pericardium 6 had less nausea. Uh, sorry, less nausea throughout. So the, the top fearing group there was the acupuncture group. So all groups got some improvement, including the sham, but the acupuncture group had the most effective um, improvement. And what was really interesting was the traditional acupuncture group had five aspects of, um, of the emotional, of the health, um, what did I call it? The, it was the SF36, which was the kind of measuring their health status. The pericardium 6 had two, the sham group had two, and there was one aspect in the no treatment group. And that is what you see in practice, is it's, sometimes it's not the vomiting, it's the actual quality of life that women are really grateful for. So there was no difference in vomiting. Again, that may be because this group um, didn't have anybody who was severely vomiting in it, it's hard to tell um, what actually was happening there. They suggested that they may needed to have treated the woman more for vomiting. Um, it's interesting from my perspective, vomiting is not always the cause that will lead no, uh, will, that women will come and visit you for. It's often the nausea that really grinds them down. So I, I just think that's really interesting that in terms of their overall um, social and emotional health, acupuncture came out as far superior. So they looked at things like they were treating liver chi stagnation, stomach or spleen depletion, deficiency, stomach heat, phlegm, heart chi depletion, um, heart fire, local abdominal points. So really good, they had a good range, this acupuncturist had a good range of treatments to choose from. It's quite useful. So they said, and this is something that again needs to be promoted, that traditional acupuncture diagnose, diagnostic patterns were more effective than using pericardium 6. So I'm not sure, but um, where I practice, we have you know some GPs and people using acupuncture, and women would often say, "Oh, I tried it for a previous pregnancy with so and so. He used the point in my hand; it didn't work." So it's important to sort of say, "Well, actually, we have a system that's actually shown to be more effective than just using pericardium six. Um, and she also looked at how safe it was. So what she collected data for was all the um, perinatal outcomes, congenital abnormalities, complications of the pregnancy and the newborn. So even though they only had acupuncture for the first, you know, for four weeks, she followed their pregnancies through to check out what actually happened to these women. So actually there was no statistical difference between the groups. Now this was a study of no, it's 593 women, so nearly 600 women, so Roughly, if you want to round it off, you know, 200 women in each group. So it was a nice large study. It's quite well accepted that this is a, a very good study. Thank you for taking Prodi Seminar's online course. 
For more information on this or other live distance or online courses, please visit www.prodeseminars.com. That's www.prodeseminars.com.